Well, it's great to have some uh, friends with us here this morning to discuss what to do after harvest. This is our Beyond Harvest webinar. We're going to talk to some expert folks today about soil testing. Lots of folks are in various days of wrapping up on the 2023 harvest. I'm not sure exactly where they're at at home, but I'm hoping to go out there this weekend and find out a little bit more. But there's always the question of uh, what what are we going to do next year in terms of fertility? And of course, everything that happens in the field uh, reflects on on what will happen next. And we use data to to find out what our next move in the chess game of of farming is going to be and how how best to deploy our precious resources um, and and fertility. So we'll dive into that uh, during this webinar with our experts on the call. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to introduce our panelists today, uh, starting with Fritz Britz. He is the integrator at SureGrow Solutions in Langenberg. He was raised on a mixed farm in Northwestern uh, South Africa and holds a genetics degree and an MBA from Northwest University. He has 18 years in the seed industry uh, with different companies like Monsanto and Bayer, and he's also managed irrigation-based farms, growing various crops and cattle. Lots of experience, but now we're really happy to have him part of the Eberhardt family of companies. Welcome, Fritz Britz. Good morning. It's it's a pleasure <laughs> and a privilege for me to, to join you guys. Well said, well said, my friend. It's going to be a great conversation. Additionally, on the call today, we have Deep Patel. He is the operations manager at SureGrow Solutions in Langeburg. He's originally from India. So we're, we're very global this morning. I love it. I, as a Saskatchewan farm boy, I just feel like, wow, I don't have as exotic as a background as you folks, but uh, yeah, Deep's from from India. He moved to Saskatoon in 2011. Uh, he's got a focus on plant expertise. He's got a background on microbiology and biochemistry. We love that stuff. From Anand Universe uh, Agricultural University, he's had roles at Agrosoma and Tiberisome Technology, and he's currently an articling agrologist. He's on the path to becoming a certified crop advisor. Welcome to the webinar, Deep Patel. Thank you so much, Dan. Good morning, everyone. Right on. Okay, great. And and last but not least, uh, a little bit of a special guest today. He's also in Brandon. It is Demetrius Teledis, the owner of 4-Hour Agronomy. He's got experience managing 110,000 acres and scouting 45,000 acres. I don't know how many plants he's touched and looked at and prodded and poked, you know, uh, probably in the zillions, but he is an expert in agronomy. Uh, plant genetics and waste management, which fits right into our wheelhouse. He's a certified crop advisor and manure management planner. Uh, Demetrius specializes in soil test reports to optimize outcomes for farmers, which is the very topic. Wouldn't you know what that we're going to be talking today? Um, welcome to the webinar, Demetrius. Thank you very much. And just to, to add, because everybody's from somewhere in the world, I'm originally from Greece. So That's right. <laughs> I don't know how we missed that, but it's a dead giveaway as soon as you open your mouth. And yeah. um, I just got to ask, like, what is the best dish from Greece? You must have, what is your favorite go-to best dish from Greece? Uh, uh, that's the problem with me. <laughs> like, I, I love food, so I have lots of favorite uh, dishes and uh what one. I like the most, especially <laughs> it's it's it depends on the season. Like during the summer, I like to have a mixture of vegetables and and meat and fish, of course fish. And during the winter, mostly meat. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like well, we could probably do to... uh, we could probably do a webinar on taste testing in Greece. Exactly. But, yeah. Uh, today, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> today we'll stick to soil tasting. You know, put it in your mouth. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah. A little exactly. More, a little more N and P. Need a little yeah. more NNP. <laughs> <laughs> Potassium is a salt. <laughs> yeah. Oh, a little salty. A little yeah. salty yeah. in the seed yeah. row. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're gonna we're gonna talk about soil testing. I think it's great to have a reminder every year about this because it's something you need to reinforce the value of. And as I was, you know, doing some prep with you guys and asking you, what do you really want to talk about? Uh, maybe not surprisingly, all three of you folks said, well, we want to talk about the value of soil testing. And I think obviously that's reflective of maybe, you know, relatively speaking, the small amount of soil testing that actually gets done. And I'm really my first question, and we'll go around the horn on this is, you know, what is the value of soil testing? And I, and I, and I guess just to juxtapose that, or maybe give the flip side of the coin there, what are folks doing if they're not soil testing? And, and maybe that'll help highlight the the value of the soil testing. So who wants to Who's bright-eyed and bushy-tailed want to tackle that uh, controversial subject this morning first? Uh, 
I can start. I can start. All oh, right. I um, love it. Greece, yeah. Greece. This guy from Greece is really aggressive. It's going to be good. No, uh, like because of our experience, like when we start working with some farmers that they don't have any soil test reports from the past, what they usually do is they apply, for example, every time they have canola, they apply 100 pounds of nitrogen uh, flat rate on every field without knowing exactly how much nitrogen they have in soil. So when it happens to start working with these guys and we do some soil testing and we tell them, you know something, for these five fields, you don't need to apply any more nitrogen next year because you already have enough. And he had no idea that was that there was so much nitrogen on his fields because the common practice in the area is to apply a specific amount of urea or anhydrous or whatever. And it's basically money sitting on the ground for them. Yeah. And as soon as we tell them, you know, you don't have to apply any more nitrogen for next year, even, even though you have, uh, uh, you are targeting 90 bushels of wheat, like there is too much nitrogen already. Yeah. Initially, when we tell them that, they have a hard time to accept it. And they are very nervous during the season. But as soon as they see the final results, they realize, okay, like, <laughs> like what I was doing all these years. And it's hard <laughs> to understand something that you don't see. You cannot see how much phosphorus, how much nitrogen, and how much potassium you have on your soil. It's us, as human beings, our brain doesn't work this way. We have to see things in order to believe them. And it's, uh, it takes time. It takes time to, to, to convince them. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, they see the value. And they, they start wondering what they have done all these years in the past. Right. Great answer. Well, Fritz, yeah, what do you see? What is the value of soil testing? What are folks doing before they find you and you, you change their life? Yeah, well, I would like to um, um, that, uh, compliment um, Demetrius on, 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 on the fact that, you know, not, not only are we, are we applying recipes if we don't know what's there, but we can, we can, um, Have have some imbalances in the soil that that has has a direct effect on 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 the on the, on the plants. So so um, in 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 just looking at specifically what's available, we can adjust the recipe a little bit to make it make the environment for the plant even better. Yeah. To to produce a better crop. So 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 the you can you can utilize the same. Um, money that you that that you spend on 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 traditionally nitrogen if you just channel the same money into into what what the plant really needs in a balanced diet um you can you can gain a lot a lot more from from the same resources yeah so yeah. by reallocating some money to to this this data and balancing your crops sometimes the economics will more than pay pay for that that effort i guess and yeah. I, as you guys are talking to i'm also wondering about you know the theme that that emerged from agritrend over the years of, of balance and how key that is and and sometimes folks can be applying nitrogen that's actually uh, creating a net, net negative effect so not only are you over applying but you're creating an imbalance that can, that can hold back your productivity and, and an example that comes to mind is these these areas where they're just putting on ams year after year you know into soils that that actually start to go backwards go, but it's hard yeah. to break that it's hard to break that mold uh deep what are you seeing as the value and 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 how are folks getting by without without this data what's the go-to strategy without this yeah like uh you know i'm in a strong agreement with what demetrius and fritz said and you know i'm i'm a big time foodie like demetrius as well so i'm gonna <laughs> throw in a food analogy here and there so what I think is the significance of the soil test is it helps us understand the appetite of the soil, right? So it's like walking into McDonald's or any restaurants. You first need to know the appetite. Like, if I only have room for a salad today, why am I paying for the five-course meal? I won't be able to enjoy it. <laughs> I won't be able to finish it. It's not good buck for my money, right? So that's that's how I look at it. And that's... that's and. Um, as Demetrius said, it's a, it's a hard concept for a lot of growers to understand. And once even they understand, we as a human beings have such a hard habit of putting a dollar value to it, right? So And so I, what I want to um, emphasize today is along with saving money on your inputs, I think it's also about redistribution. 
hmm. of your resources, right? So the amount that was going excessively towards the the fertilizer input, now they can we as an agronomist can help you redistribute those resources towards something else. You know, maybe there's a tractor that needs a repair. Maybe you know there's a new model of and the components, the fertilizer, the formulations are changing on the yearly basis, right? So what the recipe card said, add this to the soil 10 years ago, the formulation has changed, right? <laughs> so I think that's that's the gap. That's the gap that as agronomists, we help uh, to minimize and, you know, and at least try and make them understand that this is the best uh, best way to go about it. Well, when you started making that analogy about restaurants, I was just thinking as a kid going to Bonanza and all you can eat shrimp, you know, and you know, yeah, all the time. Yeah. you've been waiting all week. You're going to eat as much it shrimp just, and you've starved yourself. Just go crazy. You're yeah. going to eat 30 shrimp. You're yeah. going to make it count. But I think for plants, obviously they're very intelligent in their own way, but you know, I, I think you guys are getting down to some of the intricacies of, of not only amounts, but placement and availability, which we'll talk about, exactly, but yeah. Let's back up the truck and just talk about the physicality of getting this done because it's it's hard work. And I know that Demetrius has been you know cheating because he's not drilling every hole by hand. He's got him this hydra hydraulic thing. Well, I, I I did it I did it manually for the first five or six years, and then I Whoa. decided to change. Oh. About I can tell change. by your shoulders. I can tell by your shoulders. You I think we are all guilty of years. that. Hydraulics <laughs> is the way to be. <laughs> yeah. Well, we did it. We did it in the winter. Both both ways were uphill um, when I was a kid. A soil sampling. The ground was frozen, and it was uphill both ways, and four oh feet of snow. But <laughs> let's talk about what what it takes to do soil testing. The physical process. Um, how many how many soil tests are you doing? What does the season look like? And w what's the timing of all this process that you're in right now? Uh, let's talk about that. Uh, why don't we start with Demetrius on this again? Yeah, we we are doing approximately. Uh, 400 field, uh, 50 fields, something like that. Like wow. We do soil sampling. Some of them in zones, like we have two or three or four zones, and some of them are flat rate. Uh, I would say 50-50 is the average, more or less. Um, the precedence of uh, VR versus flat rate. Um, it's, it's a little bit, uh, uh, it's very time consuming, uh, and it's a little bit stressed. It's a stressed period for us because uh, some guys they want to apply some 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 of their fertilizers in the fall like phosphorus or potassium, so we need to to have the soil testing done as soon as possible so we have the the recommendations ready for them, and you have to fight also with the elements like some days it's uh, it's very wet it's raining or it's uh, the soil is frozen or it's very cold, um, and as I said at the beginning like I used to do it uh, manually so it was even harder. Uh, now we have hydraulic probes installed in our trucks and it makes our life a little bit easier. But the good thing of being um, on the fields and doing the soil sampling ourselves is we have a very good understanding what is the soil texture of the fields. As right. soon as you, you take the course and you have a look at the, at the soil, you can see, okay, like this field is very strong. Is, is field A is way stronger than field B. So you can have a way more realistic yield targets at the end of the day. Um, last week, to just to give you an example, I was on a new field for a client and his impression was, oh, this field is excellent. I'm very happy that I, I bought it. So I'm going there to take, to, to take soil samples. And there was good quality soil on the top 12 inches. And then after that, it was gravel. It was pure gravel. Uh, it was extremely challenging and hard to to go down to 24 inches because you i usually go 0, 06 6, 12 to 12 and then 12 to 24 inches uh, i was only able to take course between 12 and 24 inches like in three spots like the rest of the field on the rest of the field it was pure gravel the second surprise was when i have when i had the report back because there was not much nitrogen on the on the top 12 inches but there was lots of nitrogen between 12 and 24. But mm -hmm. by, by me being physically on the field, I know that plants won't be able to access this nitrogen deeper in the soil because it's pure gravel. So uh, when I will make my recommendations, I, wait, I, I will not take into consideration that much how much nitrogen we have very deep. So it's very important for someone who is making the recommendations to be physically on the fields and have an understanding of the structure of the soil. This is what I believe is 
very, very important when you have the discussions with your clients or with farmers, what yield targets we need to have next year and how much uh, fertilizers we have to recommend to them to apply. Um, That's a really interesting yeah. point that you're physically soil truthing and getting a feel for, you know, not only uh, yeah. not only the data that comes out, but you know the texture, and you were you were referring to the moisture levels. I mean, that gives you a little yeah. bit of indication of where we're at, and then you can probably gauge how much moisture is coming in, and and do your uh, Greek soil soil tasting. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah that may be thinking like because uh, some guys they use these sophisticated softwares. Well, the softwares you load the the soil test report, and the software gives you back recommendations. Yeah. If I was not there on the field. I would I would think okay this is we have so much nitrogen here like we can we can cut back on our nitrogen recommendations but by me being there like it's a, it, it makes a difference like I know that the, I have to to recommend a little bit more this yep. is what I want to, to to make clear yeah what what are you folks in sure growth doing in terms of you know the amount of soil testing you're doing per field or do you manage it by zones or if I'm a farmer that's new to soil testing what can I expect how many holes are you going to punch in my in my field here well I, we, we do offer we do offer two two versions of soil testing to our clients the first version is is just a, a base rate where we where we um, look at look at um, application of fertilizer from a, from a from a, um, a base rate spectrum where where the farmer chooses to um, not go into zones okay in specific fields and then we sample accordingly and then and then um, the majority of our clients actually um, have have us um, draw zones on their fields to um, identify the, the the highest yielding areas in the field and then and then we can adjust our our recommendations for fertilizer according to to yield potential within the field and then um so so once 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 we go into that realm we have to sample in individual zones to yeah. to be able to you know adjust our recommendations according to the zone and the nutrients that's available in each of those zones. Yeah, and that's that's for the customers that are looking for variable rate ability. Variable. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. And you guys are working with the power zones from Tremble to help determine yeah. that some of the yeah. Yes. Yeah, from Tremble and a couple other uh, other platforms as well. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have anything to add to that, Deep? You know, the physical process. Uh, no. Yeah. Uh, and how much and where? How, how yeah, many? Uh, like on the, the base Christmas rate, part, huh? on the base rate and the upper rate, how many soil tests are we taking? What's what does that look like in terms of of effort and cost? Well, I think the the way we approach those two things are very different. You know, with the base rate, we are not creating any zones in your field, so it's more of a physically going there and making an analysis and taking the course. Whereas with variable rate, the the whole journey starts with. Um, getting the field boundaries done, processing the images through the platform, creating the zones, learning uh, to fine tune the balance between the best and the worst uh, uh, zones based on productivity and DVI. So it, it's, it's, it's the data, or should I say, it's the result you get by compiling six or seven year of productivity data through satellite imaging. And then we fine tune that, we create zones, and then um, we take course based on per zones. And as Demetra said, you know, imaging technology can only help us so much. You know, the, there's a whole new beauty with the ground truth thing. So on screen, we might see that, oh, it is a perfectly okay zone. But when we go out there, you know, it could be a saline spot or it could be, uh, you know, an area completely covered with weeds or whatever. So that is not a true representation of the field. Yeah. Right. So, so. Uh, that is one extra layer of uh, understanding that one needs when you go out there to see how well um, the technology reflects what's actually out there. So. Yeah, so you guys have alluded to uh, to ground truthing. You've alluded to the soil testing. Obviously, that's the topic of this webinar. Uh, you know, we wanted to bring tissue tests into this, and then there's imagery. Mm -hmm. Who would like to take a stab at describing, like, as an agronomist, what are all the pieces of the puzzle that you're putting together here? Uh, this obviously soil testing is a big part of it, but what is it? What are all the tools in your toolbox, and how do you try and apply them proportionally to get 
to get the answers and make decisions, right? Like, what are you all collecting here, factoring into your decision and, and by what portion, like how, how big of a pie, a portion of the pie is the soil testing with all the other tools, like the imaging and the tissue testing, where does it all fit together, Demetrius? Yeah, that's, this is a very good question, Dan. Uh, there are, right now, there are so many tools for farmers and agronomists uh, to take decisions. Uh, but so I would say soil sampling is is uh, uh, is very, very important. Like it's step one. It's step one of uh, having a successful year, uh, but which helps you to understand how much, uh, how much fertilizer you have to apply for next year. But then, as you said, we have tools like imagery, satellite imagery, and uh, tissue testing. And with tissue testing done on different growth stages, you can basically check if your fertility program is right or not. Okay. Uh, but again, like uh, tissue testing, like you need to, to have in mind a few things. For example, if I see on a soil test report that they have too much boron in soil, but on the tissue test, there is a boron deficiency in the plant. I need to take into consideration that boron moves to the plant through water. If it was dry before I take tissue samples, then I expect to see low boron levels. So again, we have to, to be very, very careful when we recommend things and why we recommend things. If, if I'm expecting to have some rain in the next week, I won't recommend any applications of boron, just to give you an example. Uh, but also satellite images helps you to to see where are the best uh, the best uh, areas of the field and uh, um, how the plants look like. We always compare like when we do the the scouting of the fields. We always compare the low leaves compared to how the young leaves look like, so we can have an idea if there is any nutrient missing because some nutrients move from the older leaves to the younger leaves. Uh, like there are, and of course, uh, you always have uh, the the conversation with with the farmer. What's your budget? What do you what do you want to achieve? Uh, like on cereals, for for example, like do you do you want to push for some uh, higher protein levels? And um, to do that, we know on cereals all the nitrogen that you apply after flag leaf goes to the yield, and then all the nitrogen that you apply after flag leaf goes to the protein. So. It's it's always a very uh, um, uh, very interesting discussion that you must have with a farmer to determine what is your final target here. How are you guys putting all the pieces together at Sure Growth? How do you folks see that? Yeah, well, um, Dan, I, I think a, a very important piece for us is is to understand the the, the systems that the farmer use. Um, Every farmer has got unique systems in his in, in, in within 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 his farm, and and we need to understand as agronomists, you know what what exactly the system is, and maybe we can may, not only can we can we look at look at the uh, while while we use the samples to drive our decisions, but then but then we can also tweak the system for the farmer a little bit for for instance, um, you know. Decisions of of making full full applications for for sulfur and potassium, you know, if there's deficiencies, and and um, for if you if we detect deficiencies for 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 those, we can we can work work into recommending um, to to get out of the plant out of the plant or some of those nutrients that 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 actually. Um, Will will streamline the the farm the, the whole farming system. So so we we work together to try to streamline and simplify the farmer's environment for him as well. <laughs> I'm just thinking of all the things that you have to know, and I totally forgot, or or hadn't occurred to me that the farmer is such a big part of this equation. Because you know oh, what what have they been doing? What equipment do they have? What existing practices are in place? What's their perception of this and that? Yeah. Oh, it's just it's just really exciting to think about all the all the pieces of information. Like what is the logistics know. in the farm? Yeah, the logistic exactly. And I, I think you know logistics it's, trumps agronomy, right? So go yeah. ahead, D. Yeah. And go ahead, D. I think it also helps to understand a bit of a philosophy of a farmer as well, right? Because right? every grower, every farmer has a different philosophy for the farm for the egg uh, agriculture. That's true. Some yeah. are profit driven some are you know more invested in the long term some are looking 
so far ahead that they are envisioning their second or third generation still, <laughs> you know, so they are more focused on the soil health uh, along with the, right? So, so just understanding the philosophy and trying to align ourselves as best as we can with theirs. Yeah. Because there, there, there's a different approach, you know, certain nutrient management is like investing in millennials, instant gratification. <laughs> certain <laughs> certain yeah. nutrients are well, we're going there, more are of we? a long-term <laughs> plan, right? More of a long-term yeah. plan. What we put down this year, it's not so instant as next year, we'll see the difference. No, it's, it's more, it's gradual building your soil health. It's gradual building up that nutrient level in the soil for over five, six, seven years, 10 years in some cases, right? If I think that's such a great point. Time. You know, I, so, I think you're sorry. making me wish you're making me wish that I started there now because really that's where oh. we should have started. But maybe Demetrius, <laughs> you want to talk a little bit more about that genesis of how you work with producers and what are the kinds of questions that you ask producers when you sit down with them? How are you doing goal setting? How do you tailor your program for the farm's different goals, be it yield or longevity or expense management or tabletop crops? what does it look like when you sit down with your producers in the beginning? Yeah. Uh, because now I work almost 10 years with some guys. I know the way they're thinking. So as uh, Deep said before, like some are more aggressive than others. And uh, with, uh, with some farmers, we just try to decide whether we need, for example, to build soil levels a bit or to maintain. Um, and the strategies within the same farm might be different because some farmers own some land and then they rent some other land. So you have different strategies even on the same with the same it's farmer. The farm. Yeah. 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 Because uh, uh, as I said, or a farmer tells me I'm I'm not gonna farm this field next year. So we have a totally different approach when that happens. Uh, but usually we try uh, the, the the most challenging thing is to try to to have very realistic yield targets. Uh, everybody wants to target sixty five bushel canola, <laughs> like they make them feel happy or nice. But <laughs> is it realistic on some on on the fields? Like, can are we gonna spend just money doing that and make ourselves feel better, or it's it, it's something we can achieve at the end of the year? Um, this is this is I think the one of the most important discussions we have. And then uh, the next step is what are the logistics? Like what, wh how we can apply these nutrients? Uh, are you set up to apply some of these nutrients seed placed or how much we can apply seed placed? And then uh, we try to decide if it is better to apply some of them in the fall. So it makes our life easier in the spring and we can go faster in the spring. And also it depends how, how, how big these farmers are. Uh, I have some clients who have 21, 22,000 acres. I have some others who have 3,500 3, acres. So uh, each one of them is different. And But year after year, you know approximately what happens. And uh, uh, this procedure becomes easier and faster. Mm. With It'd be very clients. interesting to, 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 to look at where some of those customers were a decade ago before you, you've you been working with them and then through incremental changes over the decade where they are yeah. at now and how happy they are. They must be extremely happy working with you, Demetrius, with all the yields and everything <laughs> and, and profitability. And, uh, but, I hope uh, so. I hope yeah, so. <laughs> sure growth, I know sure growth has a pretty extensive process too for for taking folks in and, and meeting those goals and discussing that. Can you guys tell us a little bit about that process, how you handle that initial consultation or how that consultation evolves over over time? Yeah, um, we, we definitely, definitely, um, for, for, uh, uh, on the first contact with the farmer, we, we, we need to first understand his practices. So, so we establish what, what he has been doing. And then, and then um, the first step would be to, to do soil, soil analysis to understand what, you know, what, what, what we need to try to rectify or, or fine tune a little bit. So, so, um, and then it, 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 it's nice to build long-term relations with farmers. You know, there's there's there's, there's definitely a, a, a focus for us to to have long-term relations with with farmers. We we are not in the business to um, just have a client for one year. 
I would, we prefer to have clients for, for, for a lifetime. Um, and, and, and I like the, the term generational farmers. Um, <laughs> so um, it's, 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 it's much more important for us to have a good relationship over a long time because um, soil sound, science is not necessarily a, a short term, a short term science. You, you need to, you need to evolve with, with your farm. And, and, and so, so that is, that is our focus. If, if it comes to clients is, is we want to build long-term relationships and, and help the farm farmer over a time to increase his pro productivity. Right. Well, there's lots of intricacies um, when we're looking at these different components and, and what I wanted to do now. So we've, you know, consulted with the farmer, we've gone out and we've done the, the magic, uh, you know, <clears throat> shoulder press there a few, few thousand times. So we can, we can look as, uh, as buff as, as Demetrius, but let's bring up a soil test here. And where do your eyes go? What are you looking at? What are you excited about? What do you, what, what pops out at you? How do you, work through some of these nutrients. Some of them are mobile in the plant, but not in the soil and vice versa. Um, who wants to be the uh, tissue test whisperer? Maybe I'll bring up uh, this example for sure growth on Aberhart Farms. They can talk about that. And then Demetrius will circle back to the example that you sent me. Mm -hmm. And you can talk about that because this is uh, just a few different examples. But uh, who wants to tackle Who wants to tackle this? Can you guys see this okay? Yeah. yeah. What are we looking at here first? What do we most care about? And um, how do you how do you read all this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the, the first thing that we should notice from, from this soil test is, is the fact that this was done for, for, for different zones in the field. So okay. this, this is an example for, for a variable right um, field. Um, if, if you look to the left, there's, there's, there's three zones, the red, yellow and green zones that we have identified in the fields. Okay. Um, the red zones um, typically are the zones with, with the lowest yield potential. The yellow zones is, is, is zones that, that we consider average for the field. And then the green zones are the exceptional areas in the field with very high productivity. And um, so, so looking at this, Typical soil sample like this, we 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 typically firstly look at the nitrogen levels. So if you if you look at the fourth column to the right, there's a very important com uh, for, from the left. Sorry, the fourth column from the left. There's a very in, important column called OM, organic matter. Ah. Um, we you need to understand that that nitrogen is is a complex nutrient that 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 actually um there's a lot of nitrogen in the organic matter within the within the soil so there, there's the component com component that we look at um if we look at nitrogen specifically yeah and then a few columns further further on this 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 the nitrogen no3 yeah. which which um is is actual nit nit nitrogen available for the plant? Yeah. And 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 these these are the is, is uh, are your stores that's available to the plant immediately. And and so so the next the next very important um, element that we look at is 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 phosphorus, which is which is the the uh, the P biocarp, just just uh, a few columns to the right. Um, if you look at if you look at the soil testing, there's a there's a there's a big relationship between the pH of of soil and phosphorus. You have yeah. to understand that that um, the pH has a very good, big role. So so we we do, if we do soil we do different methods of extracting the pH values. And um, if, if the pH are above a certain level, if, the, if we have high pH, we use, we use pH biocarb data to, to drive our decisions. And if the pH are lower, we use the pH one method 
to drive our decisions. And and those those are those are the very first two nutrients that that we usually look at. Um, maybe one of the some of the other panelists would, would <laughs> like to chip in and 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 say, you know, what what are you guys looking at? Um, yeah, I can. Uh, uh, that was really really great. Uh, a few points you made, Fritz. Um, one thing that I also like to look at is the CEC which is the cationic exchange uh, capacity. It, it gives you uh, an idea of uh, about the soil in two or three different ways. First of all, so what cationic exchange capacity is, it's the ability of soil, like basically on the soil particle to exchange um, the cations. So that's, that's the exchange of between positively and negatively charged ions. So more surface area means soil has the better capacity of doing so. So with the higher number like this, you can kind of predict that there is more clay uh, component to the soil because the soil with um, um, like gra gravelly soil or more on the sandy side would have a lesser cationic exchange capacity. So this kind of shows us uh, how well the soil is able to hold on to those nutrients because let's say if you have too many, too big of a pore size in your soil, whatever treatment you're putting on, it's just getting percolated um, down to the bottom layers. You know, it, the, the soil doesn't have the capacity to hold on because most of the magic happens in the first top uh, six inches, right? So that's the first six inches is the most crucial. So if the soil has a different texture, if, uh, you know, the nutrients are not being able to held in that top soil and gets percolated, then there needs to be a different approach, you know, instead of doing one-time fertility plan, maybe we do a split plan right. so that the plan keeps getting, right? So so that's one, of, uh, one thing that uh, sticks out to me. I think what are your, uh, here. like you guys, sorry? you guys have a understanding then of all, how all these different components, like if you take uh, high organic matter and high uh, um, CEC and, and you've got a, a lovely pH that's in the zone for, for nutrient transfer and uptake, you probably have a lot more to work with. You got a full set of, of tools. Otherwise, uh, maybe when you got low organic matter and low, low CEC and, uh, you know, troublesome pH in terms of uh, nutrient transfer, you've just got one crescent wrench and you don't, you, you can't do as much. Uh, you treat yeah. those, you, you, you treat that differently, I guess, eh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. What are you seeing, Demetrius? Is Terry, you know, a half-decent farmer by your standards, according to the folks of Manitoba? <laughs> How would you rate Terry against all the farmers that you deal with? Just <laughs> throw him under the bus. <laughs> <Manitoba>. <laughs> like there like you a go. school there grade, like go. C minus, <laughs> B plus. Yeah, no, no like uh, the first things, the first things that I'm... Uh, I'm I'm looking uh, is uh, of of course organic matter, but organic matter then my eyes automatically go to pH, phosphorus levels, nitrogen, potassium, salinity. Like these are the the first four five things that I'm I'm checking very very fast. That gives me an idea uh, what what soil type I might have on this field and what is the nutrients availability. And uh, for example, here what caught my eye is. Uh, uh, in zone one, the very the very high magnesium levels on base saturation, uh, which probably will affect all, also the potassium availability. But what the very high magnesium levels on base saturation means to me is that probably this part of the field is is very sticky when it is wet, and uh, it becomes extremely dry when when it is uh, uh, when the conditions are dry, um, and of course uh, like the 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 potassium availability over there. Uh, and just by looking at how much phosphorus we have there, like it's, it makes sense that this zone, zone one is the low yielding uh, area of the field as well. But, uh, and then I go very slowly, my eye moves very slowly to uh, the micronutrient levels as well. And uh, how much uh, how much salinity, how much sodium we have as well, and uh, that gives me a very good understanding of what's happening on this field. Yeah, that's a good good question. Um, that you a good point that you bring up. 
I mean, are we looking at the meat and potatoes? Or are we looking at all the trimmings if we're if we're in Greece? Uh, you know, we're we're on the food analogy. I I I, get, I feel I feel hungry for breakfast now. Maybe I get <laughs> time for breakfast in Greece. But anyway, it's another another webinar, Greece taste testing. But yeah, what what do you guys see here in regards to that? Like, I, I guess my question is, how far do you go down the road past the macros into the micros? I mean, we got to get our macros, right? Like, we got to make sure we get MPKS oh, taken right. care of. Mm -hmm. But do you dip right into the micros right away and try and address that and fix that in different ways? Uh, or are you like, okay, let's get our no, macros right first? Yeah, exactly. This, this is my strategy. Like, I want to have the very basic things right at the beginning. Like, I'm, I'm focusing on the macronutrients uh, at the beginning. And then if we, uh, if we see something, for example, when I can, I can print the reports for all my canola fields. And if I see that boron and zinc levels are very extremely low, then I may recommend the starter. Um, or uh, I, 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 inform my farmer that you know like from your canola fields boron levels are extremely low in your fields and we know that canola uh, is uh, can uh, uh, when you have a boron application uh, can respond very very well so we we tell him that in at the beginning of the season so he keeps in mind that okay when the flowering season comes we have mm -hmm. to be ready for a boron application during boron flowering application. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, but yeah, as you said, like just to go back to your question, like I try to have the very basic, the micronutrients uh, done at the beginning, and then I I move to the micronutrients. Yeah, yeah. well, we've got you know, one I... from you here as well. Um, mm -hmm. You sent you sent one over. Um, yeah, <laughs> is there anything that you'd like to point out on 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 this one? This looks like a slightly uh... different approach. There's a yeah. What? Go ahead. Yeah. What is uh, what is always fascinates me is the pH stratification. Like yeah. you see uh, on the uh, on the soil test report on the on the top, like the pH starts from six point nine and goes to eight point three. Yeah. Uh, and that does make sense because uh, we apply most of our fertilizers between on this on this depth like zero to six and uh, we have this acidification effect of the fertilizers um, but for example on this field like 6.9 is 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 a good pH like I wouldn't worry about this one uh, what I want to to point out here is for example look uh, uh, between the two soil test reports look at the potassium levels on both on both reports, the potassium levels in terms of PPM um, are very good. Like I, my threshold number is 150 PPM. On one field we have 410, on the other we have 280. Um, but on the field on the top, the potassium levels on base saturation is 3.7, and the potassium magnesium ratio is 0 0.2. That tells me that I don't have to apply too much potassium here because the potassium availability is very good. On the bottom field, on the bottom test report, like the potassium uh, levels on base saturation is 1.6 and the potassium magnesium ratio is 0 0.06. And I know that I will have to apply some potassium here because the high levels of magnesium will, will uh, limit potassium availability. And this is a huge discussion in Manitoba. Uh, it, it more, I, since I remember myself working here in my job, there are people who say we have enough potassium in our soils, we don't need to apply potassium. But on these two fields, in terms of PPM, the potassium levels are good, but the availability is different. And uh, we have to keep that in mind when we make recommendations. And there is an explanation, I, won't, I don't want to become very technical, uh, but there is an explanation why one field has uh, a better... Uh, potassium availability and the, and the other doesn't. We can go into that if you want. Um, but this is something that I have noticed just by looking at these two soil test reports. Uh, and then, of course, as I said, look look the salinity levels between the two fields. One field is 0 0.8, on the top is 0 0.87, 1.1, 1.1, which is, which is good. On the bottom soil test report, the salinity is high. 
that tells me that when salinity is that high, it will affect nitrogen availability. It will affect sulfur availability to the plants. It will affect uh, boron availability, all these nutrients that move with water inside the plants. Um, so yeah, just wanted to point out these differences between the two soil test reports. Because well, I really love might... how you guys are like breaking this down because what I'm seeing is, you know, you, if you, if I break my arm, you know, if I fall off the quad on the farm and I break my arm, I need to go to a doctor, but realistically, like a naturopath does, they look at your blood, they look at everything that's going on there. They look at all the interactions of what you're doing, changing your diet and, and whatever else patterns in your life uh, yields a result. And it's fascinating to me how many things you guys have already pointed out beyond I need X amounts of pounds of whatever, you know, mm -hmm. probably N and P and then the rest, well, mm -hmm. K, you know, where's potash price that and sulfur, you know, um, there's, there's a lot of complex interactions. Um, we're getting closer to the top of the hour. And of course, this is kind of a brief overview and I'm getting excited about future topics we could delve into, but mm -hmm. here's an example of a tissue test. Where does this fit in? I mean, to me, this is a bold, bright visualization of what you have, and it actually makes some, some recommendations. But how do you guys, you know, feather this on top of all your thinking that you pointed out here with the tissue test? This is a little bit more of a report card of how you've applied fertility from the soil test. I'm taking it. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. yeah. How do you guys go about this? So let's start with Fritz on here. Do you got some comments yeah. on... <clears throat> Well, well, yeah, the, 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 the tissue, the tissue test is, 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 is what's going on in the plant right now. You know, we, 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 we do the planning with the, with the soil test and, 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 and we, we do all the preparations yeah. and then when, when we actually get to see the plants grow, this get, give the, the tissue test gives us a much better understanding of, of, of what's going on immediately within within the plant as we speak you know so it's a it's a um, much more present application of 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 science so 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 just looking at at the example that you have there um is 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 the fact that there's there's definitely a, a, a boron and and phosphorus levels that 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 seems to be lacking a little bit and 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 phosphorus as as we know, um, we build over time. So 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 uh, you know we we can go back and 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 look how much phosphorus there were in the soil, and 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 probably probably you know they they would they would typically be um, not enough. Whereas whereas boron is directly connected to to water levels, like like Demetrius pointed out earlier, you know. Um, you you have to have the understanding of of what the environmental um, conditions was when you took this the sample. If you look at at things like boron, um, yeah. The, the 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 other the other um, I can I can clearly see that there's a there, there's a good healthy sulfur level in in in, in <laughs> this plant. Yeah. Um, so so so. Um, we know why that is. We get thousands of these. <laughs> why, why is that? Why is well, that? I know the answer. Me. I mean, I don't know how much you're going to do about your sulfur there. <laughs> but I might be able to hook you up with, with somebody. <laughs> but um, no, I, I, would, we, I see all the great folks that we have on the call. And if, if anyone wants to ask any questions, uh, that'd be great. I hope this conversation has been valuable uh, for you. Um, I wanted to, Terry's been making comments, of course, all throughout this. So I wanted to allow Terry to talk. I'm going to give him permission. Hopefully he's uh, fully dressed and combed his hair this morning, <laughs> brushed his teeth and everything. But, um, and I don't, I, I guess I can make you a co-host here quick too, Terry. Or no. Nope. But Terry, you had some comments about the value of what these folks are doing in the field and the ROI and how you see it. I guess you're on both sides of the fence as a, as a farmer who became an agronomist and now has an, uh, an agronomy company. Uh, what are you seeing that folks um, like yourself and other farmers that are using the sure Grow services and, and folks like Demetrius's services, what are you seeing uh, long-term in terms of um, ROI and, and bushels gained and maybe sleeping point or feeling happy or different metrics like De Demetrius 
or having a full belly when it comes to the buffet of agronomy? What what are you seeing the value of this being? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Or? Yeah, it sounds great, Terry. Absolutely. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, great job, everybody. Yeah, I think with the farmer hat on simply, it's it's just it's really about um managing, you know, your soil and your resources to to the best uh to optimum, you know, returns. And and so we see that um I think a lot of times there's this misconception that when you work with an agronomist and and do this fertility planning, you're kind of throwing the kitchen sink and spending a lot of money to get these yields. But like as Demetrius talked about, there's times where there's extra nitrogen there. Even this year, you know, we got a variability of canola yields anywhere from 40 to 60 bushels. So that's a difference of 60 pounds of nitrogen left in the field or not, depending on what that yield is, right? And what we've seen over and over again on our own farm, as well as our client's farm, is fields that have good term, good long-term fertility planning will produce more grain with with less inputs um, over the long term. And so, you know, we've seen it again on our farm this year where we've got some new land that's on the same section um, compared to our almost, you know, 17, 18, 19 year long-term fertility planning. We grew seven bushels more of wheat um, with less overall fertilizer seeded the same day, you know, all planned with soil testing and fertility. And so, at the end of the day, that's, you know, in many cases, that's anywhere between 50 and a hundred dollars additional profit to the bottom line, usually better quality, things like this. Um, and we just see it over and over. And so the growers that uh, we work with, and, and that's the main reason that we do these things in the farm, it, you can really tune these things over in the long term and just consistently get better crops, whether it's in good conditions or poor conditions and uh and do the right thing uh for the soil the other thing that a lot of people don't realize is that if you over fertilize with nitrogen specifically um you, there's not so much of an issue of over fertilizing with other nutrients you can build the soil with potassium and sulfur and and uh phosphate but if you over fertilize with nutrients you will actually hurt the yield of the crop you will increase disease you will increase um, lodging, you'll put the crop out of balance. And so there's times when farmers are actually spending additional no money to drive yield, but they're actually having the opposite effect. And we've proven that out in trials over in the past. So yeah, just get her, get her in the right balance and, uh, put more money in your pocket and, uh, sleep a little better. Well, what it's I was thinking swap. about, what I was thinking yeah. about is you're talking, Terry, if you take all these improvements over 10 or 20 years, how much better the inheritance should be for the non-farming siblings, like you know, long-term. <laughs> yeah, there might, there might be a little left for you. We'll see. <laughs> Sorry, I cut you off the Demetrius there. Go ahead. No, I was just wanted to add on Terry's comments. Like we have some fields where farmers have applied manure for so many years and the nutrient levels are extremely high. We basically don't need to apply anything than a starter. But, even though these fields are loaded with nutrients, sometimes the, the yield is not there. So what Terry said about the balance of the nutrient is very, very important. Like we, our target is not to have a field that is loaded with nutrients, but a field where the nutrients <clears throat> are balanced with each other. That's extremely important. And we see that in practice when we, we work with fields that got manure in the past. Awesome. Yeah. Well, let's take this thing home. We got six minutes to the top of the hour. Let's get closing comments from everybody about the value of soil testing and what they'd encourage, you know, folks listening to this at home uh, to think about, or maybe next action steps. If, if they're not in that camp where they're doing soil testing, or maybe they're already doing soil testing. So let's just wrap this up and bring it home. Final comments. Uh, why don't we start with Demetrius? Yeah, I would say I would say that uh, soil sampling is the starting point for every farmer. Uh, the cost of soil sampling is um, insignificant to the how much money to the total cost that the farmer spends in a field, and uh, it it gives you so so like some so 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 many things like information that you cannot even imagine. As I said, not only what is the level of nutrients in the soil, but what is the soil structure on your fields, and how 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 come this soil structure affects the nutrients availability and it helps you uh, as well to have very realistic yield targets and how much money you can spend in a season 
So yeah, I, I try to think of a reason that someone will not have a soul sampling. A soul, a soul sampling from the <laughs> field, they cannot think of anything, to be honest with you. Like, seriously. Like, yeah. if you try to think the opposite way, there is, there is no reason why somebody would not have a soul sample, soul sample from the fields. Why well, was just thinking if we had a webinar about uh, all the reasons not to soil sample, it'd be really awkward. Yeah. It'd be like a, an hour of we'll silence. Be five minutes. <laughs> it'd be like that book that you give out everything a man knows about a woman, and you open up and there's nothing yeah. inside. It's just all blank pages, you know. All yeah. blank pages. <laughs> no, nothing. <laughs> That's great, Demetrius, and it's been so great having you on. Um, yep. Thank Fritz, you very Fritz, much. Yeah, Fritz, what what do you? How would you like to summarize the today's conversation? I would like to summarize to say that there is. There is de definitely still still some opportunity and time for left for us to to, <laughs> to get involved on your farm with with, with regards to to, to te soil testing. Yeah, um, we 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 usually sample all the way to where where where, where we've got a, a, a fro frozen level, the soil frees up, and yeah. and and that window is closing at the moment. So. Um, you know, I would. You look would strong like enough, to... Rich. You look yeah. strong enough. You can, <laughs> you can push yeah, through the well, eyes. I... <laughs> you you have to know your limits. <laughs> <laughs> you, All right. you don't get you don't get in the in the ring with Mike Tyson. You you go and bully the yeah. small kids. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's funny too because I think of a Mike Tyson quote: "Everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face." And uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's great to plan, but then of course, you know, weather and markets and uh, things breaking and whatever else. But uh, that's farming. But what what would you say to summarize up this conversation today, Deep? What would you say to the folks on the call and on? The um, well, it's our conversation reminds me of this one incident. Well, one of my really good friends who has been a second generation farmer on his farm, he said, farming is the biggest gamble there is out in the world. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I think I would like to start that uh, my last uh, couple two cents about by saying that like farming is the biggest gamble there is out there. As agronomists, what our job is to provide the resources and an immense amount of knowledge out there to improve the odds and get as close as we can get to get the jackpot. Yeah. You know, because there is not just one ingredient, there is not just one component, it's the buffet of things. And, you know, just bringing that that knowledge and that wealth of connections and, you know, that's, that's where we fit in. So yeah, give us a call and um, see how we can help you guys. Well, it makes me wonder who's listening to this call using these wonderful agronomists who's going to be, uh, fo you know, a feature on uh, Poker Kings with a winning hand <laughs> and, uh, going to party in Vegas after because you, you won the hit. But there's so much that goes into it. We just got a small taste of all of these different elements that you guys are are soil testing, whispering through. It's uh it's fantastic. And it just gives you a glimpse of what, what these professionals do out in the field. And we appreciate everything that you do. I really get excited about all the uh, folks that, that aren't using these services yet. You know, there's so many untapped acres to be touched by agronomy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys drive around in your trucks and look out the window and there's just so much, so much opportunity to, to better what we're doing in agriculture. I'm going to let uh, one of the attendees final comments here, summarize everything uh, from Wayne Black. I really appreciate you attending and your comment there. Uh, I'm very grateful for it. Uh, Wayne says, great discussion. Thank you to each of you. It has been interesting hearing three different points of view. So, I mean, that for us, you know, doing these things, you know, it's fun to put on a coffee and talk shop, but um, be pretty awkward if no one was here but us um well we'll have some fun but uh you know i really hope that that this helps folks um on their path so that's it 9 a.m in manitoba 8 a.m in saskatchewan, yeah, saskatchewan. Uh, kevin judd says thanks everyone and thanks dan for another great webinar love having you guys here with us you know it feels like family and friends when we do these things and we want to i've got more ideas of what i'd like to touch on next perchance uh going forward and know nicole's listening to is you know, what does it look like when we start sitting down with farmers and do their fertility planning? What does that all look like? And how does this translate into action? Like Tom Cruise and Mission Impossible. So thanks for everyone for attending. I hope that uh, harvest has gone well or is still going well for you. And, um, you know, my my assessment after going all across the prairies 
you know, back and forth here is that most folks got more yield than they expected. And obviously that's due to a lot of the good work that we're doing, uh, better genetics, better cropping practices, better fertility, better technology, what a great industry we're in and how much better it's getting every single day. So thank you, Demetrius. Thank you, Fritz. Thank you, Deep. Thank you to all our attendees. Thank you, Terry. Um, thanks, Zoom. And uh, everybody have a great, great uh, fall here. We'll We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Absolutely. Thanks, Have a good Thank one, you. guys. See yeah. you again. Bye for now. Bye.